I don't know a lot about you. Right, uh, right? nobody does. So I'm uh, a mystery. And, and, I, and I think that's, I don't think that's unique to you. I think no. that's the, the race. Right. right, no, it's very. The profile's been really low. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, you know, while there might be some front runners and things like that, I, the average Ontario, and it's an even playing field. Um, you know, what do you bring to the race? Right. So um, the reason I joined was uh, kind of for the reason you just described. When I looked at the candidates, I thought, you know, um, a lot of good people, but um, not a lot of variety in the options that were being presented. And so I'm someone from the private sector, been a lawyer for 23 years in February and a business owner for 15 years and just thought, you know, what if we had a liberal candidate who was from the private sector and who could talk about different kinds of things and different concerns? And so that's really why I showed up and what I think I bring. So you're touching upon the private sector and bringing that piece. So in terms of issues, you know, if there was a few that are very important to you that you'd want to highlight, what would those be? So one of the things I've been talking a lot about is uh, the difficulty that Ontario employers have finding skilled workers. And I know that's true here in Sudbury, too. And it's true even in my law firm in Ottawa. We have a hard time filling spots and, um, you know, our unemployment number is pretty good. Um, Most people are employed, although lots of people are underemployed. So trying to find solutions to that so that most and it's mostly affecting millennials and it will affect Generation Z um, who will come up and they'll have jobs, gigs but not the kind of careers that were available to Gen Xers or to the boomers ahead of us. So there are things that we can do to fix that um, and to provide more opportunity. And so that's something that's important to me. Hmm. I guess that ties into a bit of a local issue. So we have a hard time maintaining youth in Northern Ontario. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, population's getting older and older. Yes. Um, You know, what out of that would apply up here specifically to try and retain youth in our Right. So, I mean, it it comes down to are there the kinds of opportunities that young people want? I mean, I know Sudbury is a bit of a a hub and it's almost cosmopolitan. You've got a lot going on here, Um, but uh, you don't have to get very far out of the city where, you know, you've got broadband issues and reception issues and all of that. So you are just not going to have young people in a community that isn't connected um, to the internet the way it is in where I'm from or, you know, most of the cities in the South. So that's, you know, infrastructure is important. Um, but also making sure that there are opportunities that people are actually trained for. Um, skills mismatch is one of the things that people toss around a lot, that a lot of uh, younger people have degrees or diplomas from college, um, but not they don't necessarily line up with the opportunities that are available in their communities. And so what can we do to make uh, the opportunities that are locally available appealing to young people? And I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but I think that is the key, Um, you know, making sure that, um, you know, Laurentian and your colleges have the kinds of programs that are actually usable in this community. And so that people aren't um, going to university here looking, you know, to move to Toronto as soon as they're done. I'm going to follow follow you up on that one then. Yeah. Seems like they've got this weird approach that the the conservatives want to put out now where they're going to fund universities based on how well they employ people. What's your opinion on that? Right. That that can't be the solution. I mean, the end game of university isn't employment, it's education. And, um, you know... Uh, speaking as someone who did English literature as an undergrad, um, you know, there are probably not a lot of people who are directly employable with their English literature degrees. And but that is not a reason why people shouldn't take those degrees. They make us, you know, more interesting and change the way you think. So there's lots of reasons to have education that isn't tied directly to employment. So so that's not the solution. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic that's very near and dear to me as well, being a Laurentian student that graduated recently enough and had trouble finding work when I got out and and keeping that stable career going forward. So it's nice to hear that those are um, issues you've been thinking about. Um, I have an 18-year-old in first year university, so I look at 
what are his opportunities going to be compared to what I had. Right. And when I graduated from university in the early 1990s, um, we were in a small recession, not, not a 2008 recession, but a small right. recession. And um, the solution that we had was we all stayed in school. Like almost all my peers have two or three degrees. Right. Um, but then it opened up. You know, and all of my friends have had good, meaningful careers. We all have homes Mm -hmm. um, and all the things that our parents had. But I, you know, I worry about my sons and people like you. Um, You know, I don't see the path. If if things don't change, I don't see the path. So interesting for me as being a woman who's interested in politics um, and and a legal geek and political geek so I align with you that way but my question would be why it's important for you to have more women in politics and diversity um, in general right well um you know 2000 and uh three four five we had uh six women premiers now we have one um so you know you, you think you've made progress and you take your foot off the gas and you find out that you haven't. And so it's uh, it's a fight we have to keep fighting. I mean, I I have had this experience. I know the other women candidates in this race have had the experience where people have said, well, we had a woman last time. Um, so isn't it a man's turn? Like, that's actually not how it works. If we were going by turns, you guys will be sitting out for about 100 years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just... Um, we, women um, are more than 50% of the population. We do bring a different uh, approach to problem solving. We do see things differently. I mean, all you have to do is listen to one of the candidate debates mm-hmm. and you will see um, how differently the men and women respond to the questions. Um, so I just think having our voices heard is important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. This is something I find interesting because I'm obviously not a woman, but i um, I think it's really important that men built the system, right? Yeah. We, we created the system. Uh, we made the rules. Yes. We, we developed everything around that. So obviously, without women in the system, you're never going to adjust to a system that brings women in. What are some of those things that, that need to happen to make it more appealing to women? Right. So right off the bat, when we're talking specifically about the liberal leadership race, mm-hmm. um, it's... Uh, it's extremely difficult for women to penetrate. The um, We have a delegated convention, and I don't know if, if you know what that is, but it is the most confusing thing, and I am just sort of got my head around it now, and it's not that I'm not smart. I am smart. I just can't believe that this is how it is, so I sort of reject that what I'm hearing is true. Um, but that really, that system, the delegated convention, really favors sort of the old boys network, right? Um, you, you've got the guys in the back room who are able to twist arms and pull favors. And if you've got a long history in politics, it's a lot easier to make that happen. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the people in the race um, wish it was um, one member, one vote, which is a much more modern way of electing a leader and um, that was rejected at the AGM last year but 58% of people voted for it. It needed to be 66%. So an overwhelming majority of liberals want to see change but but it didn't happen. And I mean even just the financial barriers to being a delegate to attending the convention if you're from Sudbury or Thunder Bay or um, you know somewhere even further north um, from Timmins are you going to come to uh, Mississauga um, and pay the $500 entry fee and your accommodation and your travel. It creates a barrier. Um, no, so- absolutely. I agree with you. That's a great point. As someone that sat on the federal liberal EDA in town here for the last four years, I can echo the um, enormity of those costs when they add up. So on, on the topic of riding associations yes so our local provincial liberal eda is not very active at this time and i don't think we're the only northern riding that's experiencing that so do you have any ideas of what could be done to kind of help revive those associations right so there are um about 30 percent of the uh, uh liberal associations in the province are not properly constituted so it's it's um it's a problem in the north but it is also a okay. problem across the province and it needs immediate attention. And so um, 
one of the things that it, it becomes even more difficult in um, associations that aren't actually held by liberals. And right now that's most of them. Right. Um, and so um, it's going to take an effort from the executive, uh, but also the new leader has to actually get into the districts mm -hmm. and roll up her sleeves and um, work at, to get these done. One of the things that I'm talking about is regional uh, policy conventions um, before the next election that also have a rebuilding component. Um, so policy and then also organization to make sure that every association is um, functioning well before the next election. Um, it, you guys are actually in a really weird position because if you go by popular support, you're winning, right? Yes. Without a leader right yeah. now. Um, if you go by seats, this would be a historic swing in massive terms mm -hmm. for the liberals to go from where they're at now right. and, and the infrastructure below them and all of that to become, to become, you know, leader. So with all that, you know, how do you get the liberal party past Doug Ford and past Andrea Horwath to become uh, premier? Well, I think it's important to take a good hard look at how it is that we ended up in this spot. Um, you know, obviously, after 15 years, there is always going to be a shift or people wanting change, just itchy feet. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't explain what actually happened. And, um, you know, it's quite common for people in the Liberal Party to say, well, we stopped listening. And that's kind of the refrain that explains everything. We, we stopped listening. And that's that's actually, I think, maybe half the story. Uh, I think it's a bit euphemistic. I think um, we really need to focus on um, looking at who we weren't talking to in the last mandate. Uh, the Liberal Party is typically uh, elected by the center. And it's, you know, working class people, um, you know, uh, teachers, nurses, um, that's typically who elects us. And were we still talking to them in the last mandate? Or uh, were we in a bubble talking to ourselves and, um, you know, imposing? One of the most disturbing things that came out of the last um, government, in my opinion, was um, what happened to auto insurance. I don't know if, you know, I don't know if you drive. I know young people don't always drive, but um, there were massive cuts to the amount of coverage you have if you suffer a car accident with the promise that your premiums would go down. Well, you got you got the massively reduced coverage and no reduction in premiums. And in fact, in most cases, premiums went up. So that was a, you know, a, a, a real example of a policy uh, that served no one except the insurance industry. Why would we have done that? You know, there are only so many things a government can do in a mandate. Why would that have been a priority? Right. And so, you know, let's make sure we're focused on. Um, the people who typically vote liberal. Let's make sure that the middle class has policies and programs and that the government works for them. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add about your vision for Northern Ontario or Sudbury in particular? Well, Sudbury is a really good example to the world that if you put your mind to it, um, environmental programs can work. Um, when I was growing up, um, I only thought of Sudbury as the moon. The, Sudbury was the moon. And um, I pictured this, you know, fairly bleak landscape. Um, and it done such an amazing job. I understand that young people actually now have to be, ex it has to be explained to young people who live here what it used to be like. And that's a real testament to what what is possible and should be, that story should be told. Because a lot of people think um, you know, what we do in terms of climate action, oh, it's a drop in the bucket, it doesn't matter, we're not the real polluters, we can't do anything. But really, you guys have shown um, that you can do a lot, and in not that long. Um, and so that uh, that story, that Sudbury story needs to be told. Awesome. awesome. So just to end things off, a couple of fun questions. Oh, dear. So <laughs> <laughs> fun for you. Yeah. <laughs> So Jeff, do you, or I can start with one. So we've been actually last weekend, we did this with ourselves. We just did a couple personality ones. So I'll lead with my favorite one that I asked Jeff and Richard. And that was just, 
if you're up a karaoke, oh, <laughs> what would be the song that you think you'd be singing? <laughs> Could oh, be anything. I don't know. Or perhaps a song that you definitely would not be singing. Whatever. Works. Oh, um, <laughs> I stay so far away from karaoke just out of <laughs> kindness, but. Um, when I am in my car by myself, yep. I sing um, Sarah McLaughlin, which is actually problematic because she's got a very high voice. She's like a mezzo <laughs> soprano. And so that would just shatter uh, shatter the windows. But that is what I belt out when I'm by myself. Awesome. Mm-hmm. What's your, um, <laughs> I guess, streaming or, or, or video guilty pleasure? Uh, well... I mean, I, I love The Crown and Downton Abbey, but those aren't embarrassing. Um, <laughs> uh, Pretty Little Liars. Oh, yeah. good one. Yeah, I, uh, nice. I am embarrassed to say, but I love it. <laughs> I love their clothes. I love their devious nature. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. Well, it was good. great meeting you. Yeah, Thanks thank for you so on. much. Really yeah. my pleasure. Thank awesome. you.